laying together this morning, I would think that all of us can think of at least one word, piece of advice uh, that we've been given uh, by somebody earlier on and they were consistent in providing this word of advice to us. Uh, this might be a parent, a grandparent, teacher, coach, or pastor, uh, but whoever it is, uh, they are very consistent in trying to provide a piece of advice for you. And for me, it was my mom. And, and, and all parents repeat many things like wash your hands, uh, finish your dinner, finish your homework, uh, you know, say thank you, or really it's what do you say? And, and, and there, there's a lot of things that re they repeat. But I remember there was one that my mom said specifically time and time again, and that's to be the example. She said it more times than I could count, and I, I am sure that there were times when she said, be the example, I just kind of responded, okay, mom, I know. And, but but she, was always, she was always on me about being the example uh, in, in a very loving way. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, she, she had my best interests at heart. And, and I think that's a perfect place for us to be this morning uh, as we just had our baby dedication. Because this is a time when a, a parent is looking at, at their young child and, and just dreaming big dreams about what's to come in their life. They're, they're thinking about elementary school, middle school, high school, starting a career and, and moving on to even having a family of their own. And, and that might be scary to think about, but they start imagining what that might look like in their kid's life. Uh, and, and that's really cool. And they also get to think about things like, how, how are they going to interact with other people? I, in what ways are they going to respond when they face a hardship, whether it was brought on themselves or or if it was something completely out of their control. It's, it's a time in a parent's life when they really start thinking about what they want for the next generation. And as, as you read the Bible, if you were to read the Bible straight through, you would notice that there are a lot of themes that come up time again, time and again. And, and one of those biblical themes is generations. Generation after generation after generation. If you read the Bible straight through, you just see it, the, tor the torch being passed on time and time again. And we see this in Genesis with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. You see it later on with Jesse and King David and King Solomon just being passed on this torch to the next generation. Then, then we get into the New Testament. We have Mary and Joseph being, being there for, jo or for Jesus uh, and who passed along these great things for, for the apostles. It just kept getting passed on to the next generation. And, and that's where we're going to be picking up this morning, because there was one apostle uh, specifically who, who cared deeply about passing on what he knew, passing on his experiences to the next generation, because he realized that he wasn't going to be around forever to be able to, to love on the people around him and to serve him and to spread the good news of Christ. Uh, and, and that's the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul, and we're going to get into more of his story later on, uh, but he was a man who was doing wonderful things uh, for, the, for the early church. Uh, and, and, he, and he came across a young man named Timothy. And Timothy, and, and this is in uh, Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. This is where Paul meets Timothy for the first time. He says, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches, this is cool, this is so cool, that so the churches were strengthened in, in faith and grew in number daily. So this, this is kind of a cool moment, though. We, we meet Timothy for the first time, Paul meets Timothy for the first time, and there are some things that we learn about him right, right off the bat, and that's that Timothy was a disciple, meaning that, that Timothy was dedicated to learning, that Timothy was dedicated to learning. He wanted to know the scriptures. He, he wanted to learn everything that he possibly could, uh, which is a wonderful thing. And it also says that he was well spoke of. This young man was, was bright in his community. He was well respected in his, in his community, even as a young man. And, and, and Paul saw something in him that 
he made him want to bring him along in his journey. That Paul was going town to town trying to spread the good news of Jesus and he, and he saw something in this young man, young man that said, I want to bring you with me. I want you to learn this stuff. I want you to be able to do these things that I'm doing. And what, what the Bible doesn't tell us or what the shepherd doesn't tell us is exactly how old Timothy is. And we, we know he's a young man, but a lot of scholars say he might be as old as 20, but most will actually say that he's 16 years old at this time. That Timothy in Acts 16 is 16 years old. And that's awesome to be able to be that well respected in your community and to have to be to be dedicated to learning like that at 16. That that's that's wonderful. Uh, and, and 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 we'll get on to later on as Paul and Timothy develop in their relationship. Uh, but as as we kind of get introduced to this next generation being the example uh, for the next generation, we're going to be looking at three truths in, in, in what it means to be the example for the next generation, uh, based based off of Paul and Timothy's uh, relationship. And number one is that for the next generation to be, to be the example, we must commit to setting that example. We have to commit to setting that example for them. If, if we dream big dreams for them and we want, we want great things for them, but we don't do anything about it and we don't set that example whatsoever, they might not get to where that we want them to go. And that's why we have to be fully engaged in doing so. Whatever we desire for them, we have to be living that out day in and day out. So we have to kind of ask ourselves, so we've been talking about being the example, setting the example, but what does that mean? In what ways do we need to set the example? And this is where we pick up about maybe like 13 to 15 years later in Paul and Timothy's uh, relationship. Uh, so we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and, and this is a time where, where Paul is writing a letter to Timothy uh, later on, and, and so Timothy is probably about 30 years old now. And one thing that's cool is that as he's grown, as Paul has poured into him and set the example, that Timothy is now in Ephesus. He's, being, he's kind of being a leader. He's being a servant uh, at the church in Ephesus, in the community of Ephesus. So we, we know that Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. So he had, Paul already had that connection, and he was saying, you know what, Timothy? It's your turn. It's your turn to go be with them and serve them and show them who Jesus is. Uh, so, that, so that's where we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, and before we get in there, uh, this is where Timothy, or Paul, excuse me, where Paul lays out five ways that he wants Timothy to set an example for the people in Ephesus. So we're going to just take, take a look at those one at a time. And if you'll notice in your bulletin that there are quite a few passages uh, underneath each heading. Uh, we're just going to take a look at one of those uh, this morning, but I wanted to provide those for you that when you go home and you do your personal study or if you're in your connect group, that you can, you can take a look at the other ones as well and, and, and dive deeper into what it means to set a, the example in each of these categories. So diving in, 1 Timothy 4.12, we're just taking this one at a time. Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech. So the first one here is that Paul desires for Timothy to set the example with his speech. And I thought that was kind of a weird place to start. Why, why would Paul just throw out speech as the first thing that Timothy needs to consider? And I was, as I was thinking about more about who Paul is, Paul was a communicator. We, we know that half the New Testament is his writings to, to people or the churches. Uh, he was going from town to town communicating with people. So Paul knew the power of words. He knew the power of, of speech, of how we interact with, with one another using our words. Because he knew that we can use our words in a very negative way that bring each other down, and, but we can use words in a very powerful way to build each other up. And that's exactly what Paul knew. And so he wanted Timothy to think about that first and foremost as he's communicating with the people that he has in Ephesus. He didn't, he, if he, he didn't want Timothy to be in a situation where his communication was so poor or so negative that it didn't really matter what else he did. So we're, we're going to dive in and actually look at 
what Paul said to the Ephesians, right, right where Timothy was, Paul wrote a letter to them, and he has more to say about how we speak to one another. And this is in, this is in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And Paul says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And I think that's something huge we need to hear this morning. That, but only speak things that are helpful for building each other up. And we have a hard time with that, uh, especially in, in our families. Uh, we can be quick to respond with uh, just some, something rude. We might not really intend to, but it just kind of happens because we're in the moment. But, but Paul is saying here, only speak what is helpful to building each other up and, and for benefiting those who are hearing you. That, that's what Paul desires for Timothy, that every single thing that he says in Ephesus, that's going to be able to build each other up, build that community up by what he says, to set an example with our speech. So we have speech. We also need to set an example in our conduct, in the way in which we behave or in the way we which, in which we carry ourselves throughout our lives. And, and if you go through the Bible, there's, that, that's pretty much all, all it is, is just how we should carry ourselves, how we should live our lives. You know, we, we have things like, uh, we have things uh, like the Ten Commandments. We have the teachings of Jesus. We have the teachings of the apostles. And what they're trying to do is just help us figure out this whole life thing. How should I behave? How should I interact with people? And, and, and we, might, we might ask ourselves from time to time, you know, what is God's will for my life? What is he wanting me to do as I go through life? And, and again, we're just scratching the surface here. Uh, dive much deeper uh, when you go home or when you're, in, when you're with your groups. But we're going to go into Micah chapter 6, verse 8 here. And it says that he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And that, that's just a wonderful place to start as we're thinking about setting an example for how we live our lives, how we carry ourselves, how we behave, to act justly, just to do what is right in every situation, to love mercy. And that, that's, that's an amazing thing, love mercy, because we, we struggle with forgiveness. We struggle with mercy in our own lives. But, but Mike is saying to love mercy, to just be head over heels about being able to forgive one another. And it seems so contradictory, uh, but just, just imagine the impact that we have in, uh, with, with people in our lives if we choose to love mercy and to love forgiveness. And it says to walk humbly with your God, that every step of the way you're, you're, you're considering and you're trying to honor him with what you do, with what you say. We need to honor God or, and set the example in speech, in conduct, and in love. Set the example in love. When I was in college, I, I went to Kentucky. I think it was either Christmas or Thanksgiving, but I went to visit my grandparents in Kentucky. And it, there was one time we went to the grocery store. I think it was just myself and my grandparents. And while my grandmother was getting some final things, my, my, my Paul Ray and I were just sitting uh, on the bench towards the front of the store. And, and my Paul Ray, he, he's been preaching for over 60 years of his life, um, which, is, which is awesome. That's so cool. But I decided that's a perfect opportunity as I'm getting ready to, you know, go into ministry in a couple years at that point. I decided to ask him, you know, what is the greatest thing that you learned, that you have learned throughout your time in ministry, your time preaching? And he, and he kind of just stopped and thought about it, which is nice, you know, to put some thought into it. Uh, so he, he nodded and he was like, I found that pretty much, no, not pretty much, he said, at the end of the day, we're all the same. Humans are the same. As a group of people, at, at our very core, we are the same. Young and old, we are the same. And, and that's such a huge thing to consider because, you know, we might have different details. We might be from different places. We have different talents. We have different gifts. You know, we've been through different situations. But at the end of the day, we all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We, we all want to know that somebody's going to be there, who's, somebody's going to be there for us, even if we've done the, 
world's dumbest thing, that they're going to say, oh, you know what, I don't care, I love you, I'm still with you. At the heart of humanity, that's who we are. We are all on the same level. We are on the same page with that. And, and the thing is, love kind of means different things to different people. You know, love to somebody is like, it's just acceptance. You know, I, if I feel accepted, I know I'm loved. Uh, some, someone might say, I need, if I feel provided for, that's how I know I'm loved. But we're going to look at uh, another thing that Paul said in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. So we can be on the same page this morning with, what are we talking about when we say love? You know, what, what does that mean? And this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. It says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. That's what Paul says love is. And, and one thing I like to think about, when I think about love, when I say I love you to somebody, like, like Anna, when I say I love you, the way I think of it is, is that you are worth it. That, that's kind of what goes through my mind. When I say I love you, that to me means you are worth it. So we, if, we, if we put that into this passage here, that you are worth being patient for. You are worth being kind to. You are worth not being easily angered over. You are worth not keeping a record of everything you've done wrong. And, and there, I'm sure there's something on this list that we all have a hard time with, showing love in this way. We have a hard time being patient. Uh, we have a hard time not seeking what we want uh, in a relationship of any kind. But we have an opportunity to set an example in showing people that they are worth it. They are valuable to us. So we, so we have speech, set an example in speech, set an example in conduct, set an example in love. And the fourth one is to set an example in faith. Paul, Paul desires for Timothy to set an example in faith. And a lot of times, especially when we're here on a Sunday morning, we kind of, we kind of limit what faith is. And, and we kind of put, this, put it in a little box and just says, this is what I believe and this is my faith. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with having that faith and having that, that belief. Uh, we absolutely need that. That's what brings us together here on a Sunday morning, what we believe and why we believe it. But we also need to take a step uh, beyond that and realize that f to have faith in something means that we have trust in it, that we have confidence in it. When you say, I, I have faith in you, that's saying, I trust you to accomplish this or that. I have confidence in you to accomplish whatever it might be. So when we're talking about faith, hold on to what you believe. Hold on to that faith. But don't miss out on being able to put your trust and confidence fully in our God. In any situation, even the hardest times, not relying on what I know, not relying on my wisdom, my strength, my abilities, but putting our trust and, and faith and confidence fully in God. And, and, that, and let's make sure we, we're on the same page with that, with faith. What we believe, but also having trust as well. And, and we're going to ju jump in here. Uh, per, the book of Proverbs is my favorite book in the Bible. I just love it. Just wherever you look, there's a piece of advice, a word of wisdom uh, that we're able to draw from. And this is in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't, don't just believe that he exists. Don't just believe that he created the world. Don't just believe that he sent his son to die for us. Those are amazing things and wonderful things. But we need to trust in him. We need to have faith in him with our lives. And, and to have some form of understanding, but don't lean so hard on our own, per, our own understanding, but lean on what he has for our lives. So we have speech, we have conduct, we have love, we have faith, and the final one for setting an example is purity. Paul desires for Timothy to set an example in Ephesus in purity, to, to being blameless in the eyes of God, to be blameless in the eyes of the people around him, being, have a purity. 
And the message version actually replaces the word purity with the word integrity. Replaces purity with integrity. And, and this, is, this is a great word. And, and I remember when I was in college, I went to a Wednesday night group. Uh, and, and there was a guest speaker one time. And I remember she was talking about integrity. And she threw out this, this phrase, to honor privately what you desire publicly. Honor privately what you desire publicly. Because we might, have, we might have this situation where we know who we want to be here on Sunday morning. We know exactly who we want to be. We know exactly how we want to interact with each other. But that person doesn't always carry over into who I am at home. That person doesn't always carry over into who I am at work or at school. That person doesn't always carry over into when I'm in a traffic jam and someone just cut me off. So, but so, so in p have, having purity, having integrity, this is all about being consistent with the way that we're living. Being pure, being blameless in the eyes of God, but doing that in every single aspect of our lives. And, and as we're thinking about that with, with our actions, our actions come from our thoughts. What's going on up here tends to determine what happens with what we say and what we do in our lives. So we need, to be, we need to be very careful about the things that we're thinking about, the things that we're putting into our head and the things that we're actively thinking about day in and day out. And, and Paul, once again, I, I love Paul. He, he, he provides so many wonderful things for, for the people then and for even for us now. And he says in his letter to the Philippians, he says, finally, brothers, this is in chapter 4, verse 8. He says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Man, th those are the things that we need to have going on up here as much as we possibly can. Because if we're thinking about what's right, if we're thinking about what's pure, if we're thinking about what's lovely and excellent and praiseworthy, if that's what we're chasing after up here, that's going to come out of what we say to each other. That's, that's going to determine how we interact with each other, how we, how we choose to serve each other. Set an example in speech, set an example in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So this brings us to our, brings us to our second point, in that setting the example isn't limited to the parent-child relationship. And I bet some of you thought you were off the hook this morning after baby dedication. I'm not in that stage of life, so I don't have to worry about any of this. That is absolutely not true. We all have a job to play, or a role to play, uh, in, in this great journey of life. And, and, and I want you guys to think about, think about it this way, that you, know, you might not have a little one who's growing up, but in, in, in our lives, we are all farther along in something than somebody else is. Think about, think about it this way. You are farther along in your marriage than somebody else is. Even if you've been married a week, you're still married longer than somebody else is. Maybe you've been working and doing your job for longer than somebody else has. Maybe you've been playing a sport or playing an instrument for longer than somebody else has. We are farther along in our journey. But, but maybe it's cooking. You, you've been cooking your entire life and, and that's something that you'd be able to pass on to somebody else. And of course, we, 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 can't, we can't talk this morning without mentioning that we're, we're farther along in our walk with God than somebody else. And, that, and that's so important to, to hold on to this morning, that even though you know, you're further along than you used to be, but you know you have a long way to go, but you're still further along than someone else. So, so what does that mean? What, what are we supposed to do with that? What are we supposed to do with that? And I, and I think there's two things here, is that, you know, just because you're farther along than somebody else, that means, but there's still people who are ahead of you, right? There's still people who are ahead of you. So we need to make sure that we are open to learning from the people who have been there. We need, we need to be, keep our eyes, keep our hearts, keep our minds open to the people who have already been through whatever you're experiencing. Be open to that. And, and one thing I, you know, I, I've, I'm coming up on my five-year anniversary here, uh, serving as a youth minister at Memorial, and you know it's, it's, it's been it's been so wonderful. I'm so thankful, but I'm still really early on in my life in ministry. I'm still I'm a five-year-old, 
basically. I'm, I'm just a five-year-old, really. And, and, but, and, but one thing that's wonderful is that everybody else on the staff has been at this longer than I have. They, they, they've been a Christian for longer than I have. They, they, they know how to respond to this and that, and, and I'm able to look at them and just, and just observe and say, okay, I, I want to do this. I, I maybe not want, don't, don't follow their example there. You know, whatever, I don't know. <laughs> but but, but we're, I'm, I'm able to, and I'm so thankful for who they are, uh, beca- because I do get to look at their experience and learn from that. And then the other thing is, we've we got to go from the people ahead of us who are sharing with us, and we have to turn that around and share what we have learned and what we have experienced with the people who are still coming up in their own journey. We have to do things like that. And not just share the things that we've done well, the, 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 the positive things about our experiences. We, we do need to share those, but we absolutely have to share where we've messed up. We have to share those hard lessons that we've learned ourselves. And that might seem really, really scary, but those are things that we have to do because when we do that, 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 that might be saving them from being able to uh, experience the same thing that you did. We have to share both of those things. And, it might, and again, it might be scary to think about where we've messed up, and which brings us to point number three, and that's God isn't done with you just because you haven't been a good example before. God is in no way done with you if you've messed up along the way. And we're just going to go over some examples here, starting with, you know, I, I said that we would go back to, or we would talk about Paul's life. And, and we're going to start with that because Saul is who Paul was growing up and in into, into adulthood. But Saul was this man who was known for persecuting Christians. He was a man who was able to sign off on oppressing them, putting them down, beatings, even death. That's what Saul was known for. And to me, that's, not, maybe, that's maybe not setting the best example uh, for Christians, for people who believe in God. But God said, Saul, I'm not done with you. And that's so cool. Even, even a man who led to the death of others, God says, I'm not done with you. And he, and, and he ended up switching Saul into Paul who went on to do so many wonderful things for the spread of Christianity in the early church. Going from town to town, having to go to prison, having to experience beatings, uh, leading to his death. But, he was pour- but Paul was pouring into the next generation. He was writing letters to people and to churches that we still get to read thousands of years later. Paul did awesome things because God wanted to use him. And, and he didn't say, oh, Paul, or Saul, sorry, you've done, you've done messed up. I'm not going to be able to use you anymore. I'm sorry. That's not how God operates at all. And, and we, can look, we can look at um, other people from the Bible. Just a- anybody you look at, you can see that even though they're, they're known for some wonderful things, that everybody has their baggage. And, there, and there's a list here. That Samson was a womanizer. Abraham disobeyed God. Rahab was a prostitute. Moses was a murderer. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ. David was, had an affair. Elijah was su- suicidal. Paul sinned often. Jacob was a liar. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Noah, Noah got drunk. We can see that these people are known for wonderful things. But we can see that they really messed up sometimes too. God isn't done with us just because we have messed up. And, and I talked about my mom being the person who time and time again said, be the example. Be the example. And I think she re- repeated it so much because she knew that there were times that I absolutely was not the example, or at least the example that she wanted me to be. So, so my mom is this person who, who said that, that I need to be the example, but she was also the person who got me a T-shirt that said, trouble finds me. She got me a shirt that said, Trouble Finds Me, just soon after I turned 18 years old. And I, and I tried to find the shirt to bring it up here for a picture. Uh, even online, I couldn't find it. But what it, doesn't, what, it, what it doesn't tell you is that, besides where it says, Trouble Finds Me, there was a little stick figure with a policeman in a police car standing right next to him. And 
and there's a story behind that. Yeah. And, and I, wasn't, I didn't run away from the cops or anything, I, but I was involved from, or in, a pretty serious speeding incident. And then it was soon after I turned 18 years old, uh, because it, you know, it was actually nine days after I turned 18. And, and what that meant, what that meant for me, is that I can do what I want. That's what being 18 year old means. I, I can do whatever I want, I'm invincible. So what happens is, I get, I, I'm, it's my final semester of high school, final semester of high school, driving home, and I just take off. I just take off. And one thing you have to think about is, the roads in Georgia aren't like five mile out here. They're not straight, they're not flat, they're, they're winding, they're going up and down, and I think it's a wonderful idea to just drive fast. Gotta, gotta go fast. So as, as I'm doing this, as I'm going home, I turn a corner, and there's Mr. Policeman standing next to his bike, waving me down to pull over. And I did. So don't think I just blew right past him and uh, he, it was a nice little chase there. No, I, I decided to do the right thing and pull over where I was then handed a speeding ticket, a ticket for reckless driving, and promptly had my truck towed away. So there I am, 18-year-old Jacob, standing on the side of the road. Cop's gone, my truck's gone. I'm just like, okay. <laughs> well, I don't know what to do next. So. I pulled out my phone, and this was the phone that I used <laughs> all those years ago. It, uh, it flips like that, and the best thing is, it has an antenna. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful. So I used this very phone to call my friend to uh, pick me up, and, and he, was, he was awesome. He decided to take me to Dairy Queen and get me a blizzard before taking me home, so <laughs> that, was, that was nice. I appreciated that. Uh, but then I get home, and that's when I decided to call my mom who I didn't really tell you, she's, she's a driver's, she was a driver's ed teacher too, which <laughs> did. Anyways, so I didn't follow the example is what I'm getting at here. But then, so I called her and she's disappointed, of course. But then I called my dad and he said, we'll talk when I get home. <laughs> and, the, and to this day, I'm pretty sure that those were the worst three hours of my entire life <laughs> waiting for him to come home. But, but through all that, I just remember it's like just being so paranoid, being so on edge about what my punishment's going to be. Are, are people at school going to find out? Are they, are they going to know that I messed up? And, and how, how will they respond to that? And, what, and, what, and, and I'm just so distraught over disappointing my parents by breaking, by breaking this rule really badly. And, but I think that's kind of how we respond when, when we disobey God too. That we, that we get on edge, we get a little paranoid, just wondering, okay, is he, is he going to find out? Is she going to find out? Is, do, do they know? Do they already know? How would they know? And, and, and we, get, we get on edge, but we also get so, disappoint, or we're, we get so distraught because we're di we disappointed God, because we let God down. And we just feel so awful because we broke the rules. And we just lost, we lo we lost all of our confidence in being, being able to move forward because we messed up. And I had a professor at Johnson, uh, it, was my, it was my final semester there, and, and we had a monthly men's worship, which was uh, such a wonderful experience. And, and Professor jo Jody Owens said this, that obedience to God creates confidence in life. Obedience to God creates confidence in life. That, that if, we choose, if we choose and desire to st stay right in line and obey him and, and know that his plans are good for me, his plans are what are what be, are what are best for me. Then I, I can walk confidently. I don't have to worry about wondering if somebody found out. I don't have to be paranoid about that. And, and, and I like to kind of put that into, into my driving thing that obedience to the traffic laws creates confidence while I drive. But but I was thinking about that because if I was just going the speed limit, driving normally, if I if I was doing that and I turned that corner. My initial reaction might have been like, oh, oh, cop. But then I'd be like, wait a second, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. But, but that's how it is with God too. That, that there, there should be that fear level of, it's like, wait a second, did, did I do that the way that God really wants me to? 
And then you can t- take a second and reflect and say, you know what, I did. I did remain faithful. I did remain obedient to God. And that's when you can just keep going forward with your life, knowing that you have done the right thing. So, so what do we need to do with all this? We, you know, we've talked about setting an example in speech, in conduct, love, faith, and purity. What, what do we do now? And, and I think that this is where we wrap up with uh, Paul and Timothy here in chapter 4. And, and this is what P- Paul says to Timothy after he lays out these uh, examples he wants Paul to, for Timothy to set. Paul says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, watch your life and doctrine closely, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Just thinking, thinking about the next generation, thinking about the people that we can impact right here, right now. If, we're, if we devote ourselves to Scripture, to teaching, to preaching, if we don't neglect our gifts, uh, if, if we watch our life closely, and that's what it's talking about, setting that example, is watching our life. Don't just, don't just coast through, through life. Watch it closely. Pay attention to what you're doing in your life. And it, persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So, so we need to be thinking about this morning two things, two final things, and that's out of, out of those five examples of what we need to do to set an example, you know, which, what, do we, what do we need to work on? Maybe our words to our family haven't been the best recently, and I, and I need to do a better job with that. Or maybe my integrity hasn't really been so hot lately, and I really need to get that worked out. So think about what adjustments I, ha- I have to make throughout this week, going into this week. What do I need to work on? But then also, we need to make sure that we know who that next generation is. Who are those people that we can look at and say, I want to set an example for this person. I want to set the example for this person. We have to know those two things. But above all of that, above anything that we do or we can do for the next generation, everything has to be centered on following Jesus and his perfect example. Because Paul set a wonderful example, and in the people in the Bible, they set wonderful examples, but as we saw that list earlier, they also had their bad moments. It's Jesus' perfect example that we need to base everything on. His perfect speech, which brought healing, which brought hope, which brought love and care. His, his perfect conduct that, that has taught us how we're, how we're supposed to interact with one another. His perfect love, which also brought healing, but also sent him to the cross for us. His perfect faith, which even, though, even when he was getting arrested, mocked, beaten, and set, set up on that cross, he remained faithful to God. He remained trusting and confidence in God's plan more than what he was experiencing. And a perfect example of Jesus with his purity, that when he was being tempted by Satan, he, he remained faithful. He remained pure. He remained blameless throughout his life. In everything that we do, let's center it on Jesus and his example. Because as we're talking about generations, it went from Jesus passing it on to the disciples who passed it on, who then passed it on to people like Timothy. And it's been going on and on and on and on for 2,000 years. And it has landed on us in 2018 to take that role of of what we need to do next. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son into this world. Thank you for loving us in the way that you have done. And, and, and help us not to get so caught up in the busyness and the distractions that, that we, we miss out on being able to invest and set an example for who's to come after us. Help us to be forward thinkers uh, for your kingdom, for, for this world, that everything that we do sets up your kingdom in this world to be a better place. 
God, we love you so much. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the example of Paul and Timothy and their relationship that we can look at this morning. God, you are so awesome. And I just ask that as we go, th- go throughout this week, that we can do everything in our power to follow you. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So if, 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 if you've never really experienced what this means to follow in Jesus' example, uh, or, or if, you, if you have any prayer requests, uh, and, and you want to know more about that, you want to know more about how I can follow him with everything that I have, or if you have questions about baptism and, and you think that might be your next step, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have some people come up and, and stand up here in the front and around the sides. So as you stand, uh, come and, and let's worship together.